الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم our elders when they dissect the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the wisdom present within the quran they've assigned us basically two types of dhikr the first type of dhikr is the general dhikr and the general dhikr is that dhikr which the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave open ijaza to perform So for example, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advises us for example after the fajr prayer to make istighfar or after the asr prayer to make istighfar or the various duas that are present when or before eating, after eating, before entering the restroom, when leaving the restroom, all of these are the adhkar that are given uh, open ijaza to perform. So you can think of them all dhikr is like a medicine, but you can think of those types of adhkar as over the counter medicines. Right so basically whenever you need them whenever you can approach them whenever you can avail yourself of them you go ahead and you recite them The second type of dhikr is the dhikr which is prescribed based on circumstance The sahaba did it our elders have done it and our mashayikh continue to do it For example on one occasion one of the sahabi was one of one of the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was traveling through a village and a man approached him and said do you know anything to cure so the companion said yes i do and he was taken to a person who had become sick and in some narrations it's that he had attained some sort of mental sickness and that companion then recited surah fatiha over that person and that person became cured now on that particular instance this companion was using his knowledge of the sunna to cure an individual of a particular disease and our mashayikh they continue to do that to the, in this day and age so for example if somebody comes with the disease of anger or the disease of greed or the disease of envy each of these are diseases and each of these have their cures present within the sunna now these general adhkar assigned by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam those are enough to encompass every person's aspect of their general development they're designed by that way and they form the crux of the deen and so when adhkar are assigned by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have to really pay close attention to what they mean and what benefit they provide now unfortunately in this day and age sometimes a hadith are presented and we because of the statement present within the hadith and because it, we have difficulty swallowing those statements we sometimes downgrade what comes after those statements and i'll just give you a classical example i mean these come up all the time but for example and it's a very touchy subject and the reason i'm bringing it up is because someone sent me an email concerning it just this week there is for example a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which he went to the women of medina and he warned the women of medina that he had seen that in hellfire the majority of the inhabitants were women i'm sure many of you have heard this famous hadith when the prophet sallallahu went to the women of medina he warned the women of medina that the majority of the inhabitants of hellfire were women now after warning the women of medina he then gave them some advice and if you continue to read that hadith you'll see that then the prophet sallallahu alaihi said so give sadaqa right he warned them and then he said to them so therefore give sadaqa now in this particular case the prophet sallallahu is mentioning a type of dhikr i mean sadaqa is a type of dhikr sadaqa is a way of curing certain diseases and in this particular narration the prophet sallallahu is highlighting that for women in particular sadaqa is a very imp- important cure for what for the hellfire which is sort of the worst result that a human being can go to right So in this particular case it's very important that you look at the advice of the prophet. Now what we tend to do in this day and age is that we read the first part of the hadith and then we say wait a minute why are women the most or the majority of people in hellfire right and so then people get very caught up in that and then they ignore what the second half is. 
I mean, no one here is perfect. And actually, all of mankind was created with deficiencies. So for deficiencies, deficiencies to be pointed out in the hadith is no big deal. Read the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comments on mankind and says that they're hasty. I mean, look at all the adjectives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to describe mankind. And they're so, it just points out deficiency after deficiency after deficiency. So this is not an issue of being perfect or not having deficiencies. In this case, in that particular hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is giving the women a warning so that they can avoid that result. He's not giving them the news of, of being in the hellfire. He's telling them that this is a circumstance, so do Y in order to avoid X. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells women that they should give sadaqah. Now you'll see that women, in general, if you assign them tasbihat, they're very quick to do it. It's very easy for them to do tasbihat, and they tend to be very quick in picking up adhkar. In fact, I've heard Sheikh Zulfakar mention this, I've heard many other mashayikh mention this, that when they give adhkar to women students, they're very quick and they're very regular in their adhkar. But when you assign them sadaqah, it becomes much more difficult. And this is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting in this particular hadith, that the cure in this case is sadaqah. So for sisters in particular, when the hadith assigns a specific cure for a specific uh, disease, it's very important that you pick up on it. And this is, doesn't only apply to women. There are other hadith that apply to men as well and provide information about men in which they tend to be weak and the Prophet ﷺ advises them as well. I'm just giving you one example. Now, so the first thing is, is that, for example, in this particular case, the cure is sadaqah for sisters. This, but now brothers tend to read this hadith and then they tend to overlook it and say, see, this just describes sisters. But actually, if a brother were to focus on this hadith, they would also recognize that in this hadith is a warning for them as well. Why? Because at that time, and even up until this day and age, much of the sadaqah that women give, right, either they're working and they make their own money and they give it in sadaqah, that's great. And if they're not working and they're supposed to give sadaqah, the place where the money for the sadaqah is going to come from is from the male, right? Or from the person who works. Maybe even if their husband doesn't work, their father gives it to them, it's going to come from a gift, right? So in essence, and especially in that day and age, the Prophet ﷺ is warning women to give sadaqah, but the way they're going to give sadaqah is that they're going to receive the money from the males, their, either their father or their husband, or whichever means they have of receiving that wealth. So there's also a hidden warning to males as well, and that is the warning of the sunnah. Yani, the Prophet ﷺ had a very regular habit of giving, giving his wives a monthly allowance. Right? And then that monthly allowance was taken by the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and was often given away in sadaqah. And so even in that command of women to give sadaqah, there's also a hint that the males in the household should be providing for the women to give them the opportunity to give that sadaqah. That's the way you save your wives, your daughters, etc. from that, from that circumstance. And so there's also a warning there. Now there's two major sources of wealth that come into uh, the life of a woman that is not working. If she's working and she makes her own money, she gives her own sadaqah, inshallah that provides her the benefit and she'll free herself from that, from that difficult situation. If not, there are two times, really two major times when wealth of that nature comes in, or three. One is inheritance, okay? Number two is mahar. And this is an also, this warning is also coming underneath the category of this hadith. The mahr that's given to a sister is her wealth to spend the way that she wants. Now, that wealth, if she wants to give a salaka, she can give a salaka. If she doesn't want to give a salaka, she doesn't have to give a salaka, but it has to be given to her. And it has to be hers to do with what, to do as she pleases. So that's another warning that comes underneath this hadith as well. And that is, is that if any of us owe mahr for the brothers sitting here, it's important that we give it to the sisters because that, to our wives, because that is then the way by which they can use that money to do this good. Third is the issue of the monthly allowance. And that's a sunnah of the Prophet on them. So these are some things that come under such a general hadith, but it actually provides benefit to a whole community of people. Now the Prophet on them is addressing the women here. At times he also addressed the men with the same type of warning and gave them advice that they should take heed of. So it behooves us to, number one, pick up on the general advice present within the hadith. Right? So what's the dua we should read after fajr? What's the dua that we should read after prayer? What's the dua that we should read as we enter the masjid, as we leave the masjid? And then it also behooves us to recognize the specific cures. Right? So what frees you from the hellfire? What frees you from greed? What frees you from envy? 
and especially for the sisters in this day and age, especially when these types of hadith are, we spend so much time saying, oh, this isn't what the Prophet meant, he really meant this. Or he should have said it like this, as if we're correcting his tongue. He said it, and he provided a benefit by saying it. He wasn't trying to insult a group of people. These are the creation of Allah. He was providing a benefit to show weaknesses that exist within categories of people. And it's throughout the Quran and the Hadith that you find this for both males, females, kids, parents, children, etc. And then he provided a cure by which people could avoid the result of their actions. So for women especially, it's sadaqa, right? And that so sadaqa far supersedes any type of dhikr. Because now the Prophet ﷺ is establishing the key cure in that hadith. And then for males, in that particular hadith, it's to provide sisters with an opportunity for sadaqah, even if they have their own wealth, to provide that opportunity for sadaqah. So it's very important that we understand when we read a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ is providing us with incredible benefit and providing us with secrets of this deen. So next time you read such hadith, and I know because someone someone just sent me an email this week and they were very confused by those type of hadith, you should recognize that those hadith are warnings. They're, they're to our benefit. It's the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ that he was honest with us and that he presented this very straightforward and delivered the message exactly as it was delivered to him so that we could save ourselves from these difficulties of the next day. That's what he was concerned about. He wasn't concerned about what will people think if I say this. He was concerned about sharing a message because he knew the results of the Day of Judgment. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to act upon the hadith, to be to be regular in the general adhkar, and to have the opportunity to take advantage of the particular adhkar as they arise on, with the varying circumstances of our lives.